afternoon, everyone. My name is Tracy Corbin Matchett. I'm from Screen New South Wales. Uh, I would like to introduce our Auslan interpreter, Nicole. And before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and future. Film and television is ever present in our daily lives, and it is also a powerful medium for social change. Tonight is about bringing more diversity and more inclusion within the screen industry through raising awareness about authentic casting and disability employment within the screen industry. We have some amazing speakers for you tonight, including my own CEO, Courtney Gibson, CEO of Screen New South Wales, Luke Buckmaster, film critic for The Guardian, Paul Nanari, the other Superman, and of course, Jamie Brewer, a star of American Horror Story. Firstly, to get things started, I would like to introduce you to Martin Brown, Director of Award Courses here at the Australian Film, Television and Radio School. Martin joined AFTAS in 2011 and has blazed a trail within this role that both he and the CEO of AFTAS, Neil Peplow, have committed to helping bus stop films create and produce accessible film studies classes here as, at its world-class facilities. Please welcome Martin Brown. Thank you. Um, our CEO, Neil, uh, very much wanted to be here tonight. He sends his apologies. He's actually in Melbourne. He said it's cold and wet and rainy, so we should feel sorry for him. Um, diversity and inclusion are very important here at Afters. Um, we're currently going through Root and Branch and revising all our approaches to diversity in every aspect of the school's activities. Uh, I guess it's a cliche these days to say that we're living through a sea change in how we consume media. The, the legacy media, feature films and free-to-air television, are under threat, and the next, whereas the Netflix universe offers us enormous freedom to choose whatever we want, whenever we want it. But I think this provides huge opportunities for filmmakers and for us to push the conventional boundaries of our art form. The stranglehold that those commissioning editors have had on the free-to-air networks, and, uh, and which they use to deliver the lowest common denominator, denominator content for the widest possible audience, is loosening. In this digital age, disparate audiences seek out disparate stories. Personally, and personally, I trust the audience. I, I do believe that, given the chance, we seek out stories made with integrity, works that regard diversity and inclusion as an integral part of telling a story, not as an exception, not as a, a, a nice to have. This is not to say change is easy uh, or will happen overnight, but here at Afters, our aim is to deliver equitable access to the opportunities that the school has to offer. And over time, our goal is to foster the careers of graduates from all backgrounds who will go on to redefine our screen culture. I'm lo really looking forward to everyone hearing everyone speak tonight and especially our guest of honour. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for those inspiring words. I would now like to introduce Courtney Gibson, Chief Executive of Screen New South Wales. Courtney took to the helm of Screen New South Wales in November last year and her commitment to gender equity helped push the issue of gender equity and gender diversity in the screen industry. Courtney now has her sights set on disability and being visible on our screens and behind the camera. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Courtney Gibson. Um, thanks, Tracy. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, it's great to see such a big crowd here today. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal people here today. This, this is, was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I'm so very pleased to be here representing Screen New South Wales and thank you Jamie Brewer for being here, Jamie and your family. Um, uh, you're having such a profound effect just in these last few days of your being here in the wider media. Um, thank you Genevieve from Bus Stop Films for inviting me to this fantastic event and thank you to the Afters for hosting it and also thank you to Nicole for interpreting this evening, um, uh, ensuring hearing impaired people uh, are included. Um, also the captioners who are working here um, captioning um, the uh, presentations. Um, I'm learning lately about what it means to ensure the inclusion and participation of people with disabilities and one of the things I now know is that at an event like this you often need multiple interpreters um, because it's taxing over several hours and you need to tag team it or else live caption it. 
as we are tonight, which is kind of obvious when you think about it, that um, signing for hours on end would be taxing, but I never really did think about it before. And I, there's a lot of things I think that I didn't think about before in relation to disability. And the things that I'm understanding now, because I decided to um, open up to it, is that unless you introduce ways to have disabled and non-disabled people work together and be together, then people with disabilities are in uh, some parallel universe to those without. They're sort of near me, but they're not with me. Um, they're in the general vicinity, but they're not in the conversation. And as well as being inequitable, that makes for a much less interesting conversation. Um, as Tracy noted, um, uh, upon starting with Screen New South Wales six months ago, we determined that we would get on with actively addressing the significant gender disparity in the screen sector through the introduction of a target to achieve an average 50-50 split in our funding programs by 2020. Um, this initiative was critical in amplifying the discussion around gender equity and more broadly the inequity and inhibitors to accessing opportunity faced by all un underrepresented groups both on screens and behind our cameras. Because as soon as you decide you're gonna put one underrepresented group forward as a priority as we did, then you have to ask yourself, well, what does it mean for the others? Um, that they're supposed to get in a queue now behind the women who we are trying to prioritise. Um, of course, that's not how it should be. Um, and at any rate, in actively promoting women, we need to ensure that a diverse group of women get opportunities and a new, more evolved, more capable and more interesting screen sector can be built from the one that we have now. Um, in terms of unmapped spaces, virtual reality is a new world for screen practitioners. And being a new space, it's actually possible for us to build di a diverse industry right from the start. You only have to look at the world of, say, game production. It is largely white, largely male, largely heterosexual, largely cisgendered, largely non-disabled. And that's what happens when you don't build new platforms with diversity front of mind. Um, there's also an intolerance and a misogyny in that world, which is a product of that monoculture that spawned it and which still governs it. So whenever we have an opportunity to do something new, we really need to have diversity front of mind. Um, and in the end, what Screen New South Wales is all about is ensuring that work is made and that work is seen. Um, we support projects that showcase stories by and for disabled artists and screen creatives via Access All Areas Film Festival and via the New South Wales Arts Disability Partnership. Working with the New South Wales Department of Community Services, we've funded a suite of short films by and about people with a disability and now through our status as Sydney UNESCO City of Film, um, I'm delighted to let you all know that seven of these short films will be showcased at the month-long Bradford Small World Film Festival in the north of England, opening on June 1. They'll be screened on what's called the Bradford Big Screen, which 500,000 people pass by every month, providing great exposure for these films. Um, so small worlds uh, mean big opportunities. Harking back to the Screen New South Wales ideal that underrepresented groups shouldn't be, should be neither queuing nor elbowing each other out of the way to be seen and heard. Um, I'm pleased to let you know that now two of our 17 staff identify as having a disability. Um, earlier this year, emerging writer, producer and Metro Screen graduate Joanna Garvin, who's here, I think, I hope, yes, um, Joanna's um, here, just up toward the back of the room. Um, please seek her out in, um, in the break afterwards. Um, she has cerebral palsy and she proved to be so valuable to Screen New South Wales production attraction team um, that she was offered a contract working across Arts New South Wales and Screen New South Wales. Today she launched the latest edition of the Screen New South Wales newsletter, of which she is editor. Um, additionally, next week we welcome Sophia Gollan to Screen New South Wales. Sophia is here too in the second row, um, a filmmaker and theatre practitioner. And Sophia um, uh, joins us next week as a development and production executive. Um, Sophia is profoundly deaf, and through working with her, our staff and the content makers we work with will do things just a bit differently. Now and then, I think oh, I must call Sophia, and then I think, oh no, I can't call her. Um, I need to FaceTime her or Skype her or email her or text her. Um, and that's com actually not a biggie at all now because modern communication options are so many and varied. If we have a meeting with more than four people in it, Sophia's flagged that she needs an interpreter like Nicole. Um, and the great thing about working in the New South Wales government is that a subsidy exists to make that happen. Um, when we book that meeting, we can't just reschedule it um, in any kind of cavalier fashion because 
um, you know, that would inconvenience um, our interpreter. Um, and so it will make us more disciplined, I guess, in terms of the way we have and stick to schedules and meetings and other get-togethers. So for us, there's no downside in that. There's just myriad upsides to working with Sophia. Um, Sophia's skills and track record in, as an industry practitioner are unique and considerable. But one of the additional reasons Screen New South Wales wanted to work with her is specifically because she has a disability, not in spite of it, but because of it. Because all our staff will now adapt to working to be inclusive as a matter of course. So Joanna and Sophia are schooling us. They're giving us an opportunity rather than kind of anything like vice versa. Um, I guess we can't effectively advocate that businesses should employ people with disabilities unless we're doing the same thing ourselves. And we can't very well show people how to get on with the business of working with disabled staff and we, unless we just get on and do it. So that's what that's all about. Um, uh, I guess we look to other industries like retail and hospitality, which have for many years benefited from the active and meaningful inclusion of people with a disability. The creative industries can do better. When you consider the creation of content for film and TV takes a small army to put together. When you ponder the myriad roles, big and small, art department, makeup, runners, caterers, writers, producers, directors, admin, most of these, in fact, all of these, all of these, could be undertaken by anyone with a disability. So why often aren't they? It's probably a continuing history of inequity of opportunity, of underestimation. And it's that separation I mentioned earlier, that parallel universe of the disabled and the non-disabled. Um, you know, near me but not with me. But the logic ex logical extension of our advocacy and activity around gender is to continue to move the needle among other underrepresented groups. It's also our belief that by introducing and maintaining diversity among the ranks of decision makers and executives like Sophia, who interface with the writers and the producers of screen content on behalf of investors like us, that we will see more and more complex, nuanced and evolved disabled characters on screen. I know that Jamie and Luke and Paul are gonna address these issues tonight and as an agency, we'll do our part creating change on screen by enabling inclusion by disabled practitioners and decision makers behind the scenes to create real, organic, sustained change. Um, yesterday on reading news of our announcement about hiring Sophia, the blogger David Tiley wrote something on Screen Hub. He actually quoted Sophia, who was talking about the diversity crusade. She said, no one can hear underwater. And David wrote, for a long time in this sector, we've been underwater, oblivious to the narrowness of our cultural, class, gender and biological abilities. He said, now we are beginning to listen, to hear the haunting, fragile, beautiful sounds of a wider world. And I think that kind of David has very eloquently nailed the point of this exercise. It's like Gandhi said, you want to be the change that you want to see in the world. So that's what we're doing at Screen New South Wales in relation to disability, and we urge all our industry colleagues to do the same. Um, thanks for having me, and I'll hand you back to Tracy. Thank you, Courtney. It's very inspiring to be working at Screen New South Wales at the moment with the amount of energy and passion that's going into creating change across the industry. Uh, I'd now like to introduce you to uh, Paralympian Paul Nanari, uh, who, is also, who is the Manager of Events, Access and Inclusion in the Strategic Communications and Events section of the Department of Premier and Cabinet. Paul has been a strong advocate for disability services and inclusion for people with disabilities across all industries. He is also a, a performer. You may have seen Paul on Australia's Got Talent back in 2013 as the other Superman. Just to give you an idea, of the act, Paul once scaled a 20 metre ribbon suspended from the ceiling of the Sydney Opera House's southern foyer while strapped into a wheelchair with no safety harness. Wow. <laughs> I would like you to welcome Paul Nanari. So the first thing we need to do at AFTRS is get some um, accessible lectins. I think that'd be good. All right, can you hear me okay? All right, just like orange is the new black, disability is the new normal. 
and people with disability are no longer in the shadows. We are trailblazing and the world is taking notice and is in awe. I can't think of a time previously where people with disability are capturing the world's attention across a broad depth of talents. Television and film is a condu conduit to sharing these talents, but have only offered a brief glimpse into what is the possible and what is believable. I believe the world is now ready to embrace the D factor, and studios need to recognise and embed the opportunity. Not only to share the talents of people with dis disability, but redefine the meaning of disability through the quality of what they create for our screens. If you go to thesaurus.com and look up the definition of disability, you will find the following words to describe it. They include words like disadvantage, restriction, affliction, ailment, defect, detriment, disqualification, drawback, impairment, inability, incapacity, incompetency, inexperience, infirmity, invalidity, lack, unfitness, and weakness. As I read every single one of these words, I think to myself that they, the, that they are the complete opposite of disability. To a degree, TV and film have nurtured this definition. They have been apathet apathetic to, to further promotion beyond these words. More often than not, I expect because those in charge thinks it makes good drama. And as, a, as a speakers before, it's just maintaining the status quo of the, the, the common denominator. I would argue the opposite. Such a depiction of disability in its true sense makes, sorry, I would agree the opposite. Such a, such, such a depiction of disability makes for complacent viewing where the viewer's unconscious bias to disability is not challenged, but further entrenched and perpetuated to be false and misguided. This in turn in cultures a false perception of disability in our real world. I would like to reflect on the 2004 film release of Million Dollar Baby. Steve Drake from Ragged Edge Online put it perfectly when he reviewed the film with the following quote. This movie is a corny, melodramatic assault on people with disabilities. It plays out killing as a romantic fantasy and gives emotional life to the better dead than disabled mindset lurking in the heart of the typical undisabled audience member. I know our audiences are smarter than this, and the ensuing protests to the film are evidence to this. But what frustrates me is a film of this calibre had the capacity to challenge that melodramatic formula, formula but chose not to. Compare this to the masterpiece of Murderball, which was released the following year in 2005. In comparison, Drake describes Murderball as the following in his review. Murderball doesn't, doesn't dispel myths and stereotypes. It takes fat bites out of those sugary, sweet, pathetic images and stereotypes, chews them up and spits them out. It's not a magic pill that will make pity and, dis and stereotypes go away, but is quite simply the best film ever made on disability. I could not agree more. Murderball completely shifted the mindset on disability and gave permission for film to challenge and defy the, t the depiction of disability. The film, the, the, sorry, the film challenged false perceptions and presented the real world in which, disability, uh, in which people with disability live and breathe. The film showcased that people with disability could play me mesmerizing characters and memorable characters in their own right and it was time for, for actors with disability to take the centre stage and not those without disability portraying them. Bus Stop Films has also become a beacon to this change and, in my view, a force of nature. When I watch their films, including Workmate, Be My Brother and The Interview, I actually feel proud to be a person with disability viewing them because I resonate with the strengths conveyed by, the, by their characters who portray, who, who portray 
those roles, acted out, of course, by people with disability um, in, front of the, in front of the camera and behind the camera. More importantly, I feel a collective embrace by the wider community that the perceived, sorry, that the preconceived perception of disability have been changed and realigned from what is impossible to what is possible. Disability is becoming the new normal. Tonight we are here as part of something, I don't want to use the word special, so I'm not going to, but something innovative and spectacular. We're here acknowledging the success of Jamie Brewer and her capacity to change the perception of the world towards people with disability through her pure talent. To challenge an industry that generally portrays the unrealistic unre sense of perfection that has been cast from one mould, a mould that none of us really fit in at all. I would argue that it is our differences that, what, that, that make us perfect. So with so many positive things happening in the disability space right now, this is a call out for all of us to completely redefine the meaning of disability, to challenge, defy, and use the power of language in our conversations and on film to redefine the true meaning of what disability means. Words like advantage, opportunity, beauty, competent, contribute, provider, and strength. I think you all get the picture. Our revised definition of disability starts with every one of us here in this room and above and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for um, showing us the simple things that we can do um, here about the lectern, just a simple thing that we can think about and refraining our thoughts about disability. Thank you. Well, it is now my absolute pleasure to introduce the remarkable Jamie Brewer. Jamie has featured in three seasons of the Emmy Award winning American Horror Story and was the first woman with Down syndrome to walk the catwalk, catwalk of New York Fashion Week. Jamie is also an active advocate. She was elected to the executive board as treasurer of the advocacy organization, the ARC of Fort Bend, and has also served on the ARC's governmental affairs committee in the state of Texas. And while on this committee, Jamie spoke with senators at the Texas State Capitol to persuade them to pass a law for Texas to abolish the word retarded from state legislation and improve the recognition of the needs of people with disabilities within the state. This effort was successful and Texas now uses the term intellectual de developmental disability in their legislation. Please welcome to um, the lectern uh, to talk to us tonight, Jamie Brewer. Thank you, and also, I, I also agree with Paul as well. We need to use our voice. As you've been hearing, my name is Jamie Brewer, <coughs> and this really is exciting. And so I want to thank so many people. Best Up Films, the Australian Television Radio School, the Screen New South Wales, Taste, and the Sherry Hogan Foundation. So, giving me this won wonderful and exciting opportunity in being here. And it means a lot to me and to my own family as well. Can you imagine <laughs> for a moment that I started out in my early intervention, in my education, and pretty much like, imagine bathtubs but filled with jello and spaghetti. <laughs> This was happening when I was in, in, in my, um, I'm going to bring this a little closer, <laughs> even though I, I know, I, you know, I know, I know that you can hear me. I was a, a toddler when, when I first started all this, including sign <laughs> as well. I was fully mainstreamed when I got into kindergarten and still and continued when I graduated 
in high school in high school at the year of 2004. I have already received within college a musical theater certificate. And I'm still continuing in getting a bachelor's of fine arts. I um, first started learning about theater when I, when I was in, in my eighth grade summer. When I, and it was a college for kids class, aka a program. At, after that, after high school, <laughs> I attended a, a small local theater known as Dionysus, which is an all-inclusive theater where actors of from a wide variety, a diverse group of an, of, of able of differently abled to actors to work with individuals that do not. And with that, with that in mind, that has helped me land the character role of Adelaide, which is, I'm assuming you have all seen within the very first season, which is the fan favorite television show of American Horror Story. So now we, and I, I have always been an advocate and always still will be. I have been an advocate for myself and for others for quite some time, for quite a long time. To me, advocacy truly means, and hope to you as well, believing in oneself and you believing in, believing in yourself and others, your family and friends, believing in you. We all have our own talents and ability, our own talents and strengths. And encouraging and support is highly important. Support, I personally have had a lot, and I still do. Everywhere I let it go. <laughs> Everyone needs loving support, no matter who you are and how old you are. Support also equals encouragement to achieve your goals and dreams, which means it's unlimited. Support also e equals believing in you, believing is believing in yourself and believing in others. And I also really like movie quotes, movie lines, and the movie called Aquila and the Bee. The line is, you have 50,000 coaches. Coaches equals teachers, which equals friends and family. Because of the loving support and encouragement that I still uh, still receive constantly, I still believe that we should all try to, ins to be to inspire everybody around us, and you being inspired as well. We all have the ability to touch lives around us, no matter who they are. And I can't believe that I'm in the beautiful Australia, in Sydney, Australia as well, <laughs> in encouraging global, and I mean global inclusion. And for everyone that's around here. And together, I know, and, and I'm sure that you'll agree with this, 
we can advocate for a more healthier and inclusive, highly inclusive world around us today. So I want to thank you guys. This is all, this is tonight is, is for all of us. So thank you. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> You're a really hard act to follow. <laughs> um, we'll now it's have a truth. chance. Pardon? It's the truth. It is the truth. It is the truth. I know. I know. I'm feeling very, I'm feeling very small compared to the greatness that you just delivered us. Thank you. Um, we'll now have a Q&A with Jamie medi mediated by Genevieve Clay Smith. So it'll be a great chance to, to get to know her a bit more and hear some of those amazing words. Um, for those of you that don't know Genevieve, Genevieve is the Executive Director of Bus Stop Films, a not-for-profit um, service for increasing the English skills, living skills, work-ready skills, confidence and well-being of people with a disability through giving them access to film studies. The organisation conducts regular filmmaking workshops at Sydney Community College, here at AFTERS and at Arlencliff Community Centre. Over the past four years, Bus Stop has provided over 30 work experience opportunities to people with a disability and seven employment opportunities in the film industry. In 2015, Genevieve was named the New South Wales Young Australian of the Year for her work with Bus Stop Films. As a filmmaker, she has won countless awards for her work, including an Australian Directors Guild Award, Trop Fest, and Audience Choice at Short Film Festival and in Asia. Please join me in welcoming both Genevieve and Jamie for the Q&A. Thank you. Wow, thanks Jamie. <laughs> I loved your speech. I loved how you talked about it, you know, it really comes down to encouragement and belief in other people. Yep. And um, we all need that in order to achieve our goals. And so I just really wanted to say thank you because we all need that and I think we, if we can all be um, active in encouraging those around us, encouraging people with disability, believing yes. in them, we're going to open up more opportunities. Yeah. So thank you. And another way with that is, uh, is also using our voice and speaking about opportunities and what Paul had mentioned, we need to use our voice because thinking about choices, we need those choices, we need those opportunities mm. and, and if we don't speak up, that's when we start to feel those other terms. We will be limited in everything. And that's the biggest thing, is that we need to stop all that. And stop all that on a global scale. It kind of feeds into the idea of authentic casting as well, what you're just saying, is that when we don't give a person the opportunity to audition for a role based on what we assume they can yeah. or cannot do, we limit them, we actually rob them of an opportunity to reach their full potential. Yeah. So. Her character work, me on a set, and us are behind it. It's mm. good. Well, before we get really into this q and I'd love to watch some clips of you hey, acting. You are an actress. <laughs> Beware. You are an actress, so we want to see the performance. So, you know, we all know you from American Horror Story. We love your roles in American Horror Story. So I thought before we dive into it all, we should really, yeah, you know, watch seasons. some of the some of the magic. So we're going to have a look at some clips from your roles from American Horror Story and also from the NBC crime drama series Southland. So can we see Which you will love. <laughs> Amanda? Did you like my muffins? How many times do we have to have this conversation? You gotta stop coming by the station. This is your last chance. I am not taking you to the movies. Is it my dress? No. It's very pretty. And you're a very lovely young woman. You're just not my type. It's your loss.
The Celtic dudes believe that on October 31st, the boundary separating the realms of the living and dead disappeared, and the dead could walk amongst the living. That's why people dress up, to scare away the ghosts. No way I ever want to be a ghost. It's so sad. What are you going to dress up as this year, Eddie? Are you blushing? <laughs> Look at you. You know what? I think that's a hell of a costume. Come here. Now, who did that to your face? Violet! Violet, that girl's got another cupcake coming. Now, wash <laughs> that smut off your face. No! I want to be a pretty girl. Well, you're not a pretty girl. And you know it. I want to be. Who put her in a home? They said even daddy. But no, I couldn't do that. I don't want to be Snoopy. I want to be a pretty girl. Do you know what they think when we walk down the street? There, but for the grace of God, go I. You make them feel lucky. And they think I'm a hero. As though I've had some choice. No, it... you doing? I heard it crying. That's impossible. That closet would... Oh. You the clairvoyant. You stole this baby to kill it. You don't know what you talking about. Now give it here. I'm the next supreme. I just killed the woman's store with my powers just now. And I will kill you. What is going on? Oh. She say she the next supreme. Say, she done killed the neighbor lady. Oh, great. Now we'll have more cops on our trail. Whose baby is that? Mine. Check the skin tone. She stole it. She's going to kill it. This girl is out of line. Nan, hand the baby back to her, or I'll make you do it. <laughs> now leave. You have blood on your hands. The both of you. Go on, child. Do I have to wear this outfit for all eternity? No, that doll. You will find the other side is filled with tweets for a girl like you. Anywhere is better than here. So, Jamie, what I love about your performances is that you are great at characterization. Really, really good. So, I'd love, I'd love to know, you know, what is your process as an actress? How do you get into character? Uh, there's a wide variety of different things I do. One is, for sure, always find a way to stay on your feet. <laughs> for sure. Because if you lay down, you get lazy and fall asleep. <laughs> so you've got to keep the energy going. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that and make sure there's either hot tea or coffee running. Water, hot tea, or coffee. That's good. Yeah. Keeping up the energy levels is the coffee. And if you're really good at it, try to balance it all at once. <laughs> 
Love it. I love it. Um, no, that's really good. And so, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about your acting training? Because you have a theatre background, haven't yes. you? Can you tell me about your acting training and the process of becoming uh, an actress and stepping into film? Um, it's a really neat transition, actually. Um, because knowing the, the theater and the industry, is, it can be very different. Because you're coming from an environment that's a stage where an audience is in front of you, whereas the audience in the industry is basically your TV sets <laughs> and movie theaters and computers and everything electronic. So basically, that's your the start to an audience in some way because the director is constantly moving, moving around, even though the directors in theater do the exact same thing, but they, they're involved in the process on stage. So it's similar but very different. And what was the theater that you got involved in that you mentioned earlier? Dionysus? Dionysus. Dionysus. And can you tell me a bit about that theater? It's an all-inclusive all -inclusive theater that, um, as you said, it brings in the differently able, meaning individuals with, dis with, uh, with uh, different disabilities, from deaf to blind to hard of hearing. There's a wide variety in working with individuals that do not. And giving not just limited roles, but equal roles. They get opportunities from each. Right. So it was a so it's a theatre company where you train with people with disabilities and without disabilities. Yes, we work on plays together. We're all we're, we're all inclusive in one play. Awesome. And people would just audition for the role, and best actor would get the role. Yes. No matter what. Yeah, like one time in one play, I it was called "You're a Good You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown," <laughs> where I was offered the role of Snoopy, but I, but okay, I, okay, do I really have to get on top of that house? <laughs> <laughs> the doghouse. So I became the character role of Sally, which was a chance for me to dance and sing in Love theater. It. So Love it. made it a more easier transition. Instead of being a dog, I played a, <laughs> a young girl in a cute dress. <laughs> you, you do well in the cute dresses. They <laughs> suit so. you more than the Snoopy outfit, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so in American Horror Story, there was really interesting um, with uh, your role of Nan in the Coven. There was something yeah. different about the script. Can you tell me about how the writers approached the character of Nan in the? Script? I'm still curious about some of that myself. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, the Ryan Murphy is the main head of that show. He brings in an amazing group of writers, as well as his lead writer, which is Brad Vilcek. Their character arcs are really quite neat. It's fascinating to me on how they do it because they don't give a lot of background right away with it right away and telling you up front what the character is. You have to find it, you have to find that within the script. Awesome. And what was interesting about Nan? What did you think? Oh, uh, there's about? several things. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, what I was just saying a minute ago, well, um, I did get some terms about it. The set, sassy. Mm -hmm. Sweet. And a few others as well. But there's also, as, as you study the show, there are others as well. Yes. And one of many that you also, it's kind of a hidden one. But I also got the opportunity of and getting to feel my getting to feel what it's like to be an introvert. In some way, because uh, I am kind of a mix, I'm not really a mix, but a lot of my um, personality is an extrovert, very outgoing, a people person. <laughs> so with Nan, with one of the hidden ones, one of the hidden traits, I got the opportunity in learning how to be an introvert. So now I have a mix of both. <laughs> So she was described as an introvert, sassy, sweet, but... There are several things. There are several things. She wasn't actually described as a character with a disability in the script, no. was she? No. So the, the writers actually just wrote the script. Yes. And, and you were cast based on your talents. Yeah. Not yes. because... Adelaide was the 
the first primal one that, in, that kind of brought dis the disability diversity into American horror because of DS, and which means Down syndrome. And the other two, which is what, what you were saying, Genevieve, is that it is the truth. It was on pure talent, not disability. That's why Nan and Marjorie, a two foot demon doll, devil doll, <laughs> does not have a disability. It's great. And it's really, it's, it's, it's quite awesome to hear that there are the Hollywood writers in American horror story yeah. writing these roles and you are getting cast because of your talent and it's not being specific yeah. in the script. Yeah, another neat thing about American Horror Freak Show is also it, um, with me, with the, the Down Syndrome element, that there's also other individuals in there with physical disabilities as well. Is this really kind of neat? Good. Now, moving on to another one of your amazing achievements. So, we have a, a, an Australian model here with Down Syndrome, Madeline Stewart, who recently... She's a friend of mine. <laughs> she's a friend. Um, and she recently followed in your footsteps, footsteps when she walked the runway at New York Fashion Week. But you blazed the trail. You were the first one with Down Syndrome to walk the runway at New York Fashion Week. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe we've got a clip, so can we watch it? And in the dress that you'll see that is inspired by AHS. So the dress is inspired by American Horror Story. Yes. Even better. Let's let's see that clip. Got your stuff. <laughs> yeah. And a side note, if you want those YouTube videos, uh, more on that, that you can see the whole walk. <laughs> I can pay homage to certain characters for any dress. Oh, that's awesome. So as you're walking, you're kind of conjuring up Marjorie here and Nan uh, there. Not, and not just Marjorie. Uh, it was more to do with Coven. Oh, uh, Coven. Awesome. From Sarah Paulson. <laughs> and, and, and the Seven Wonders. To Edge with the Bassett's character, Kathy Bates, Jessica Lang, there's a wide variety. That's awesome. So, I mean, walking at the catwalk at, at New York Fashion Week is an amazing, amazing opportunity. How did yeah. all this happen? Um, I'm still excited by it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, I just, word of mouth by friends. Mm -hmm. It's the best way of saying that because um, it is honest truth. <laughs> um, by submission, by friend, by uh, word of mouth, by by friends. It's the biggest thing about that. And this is also kind of exciting. I got this has to be in New York. Yeah. It's another thing. And so the designer, who was the designer that designed the dress? Her name's Carrie Hammer. She's New York based. And she was. In she lives in New York. And so she was inspired by your. By, by your character. Yeah, she is a high, she's not high, she is a, <laughs> an avid <laughs> fan of AHS, we're going to horror. That, that's how, um, it was a, through a, an honor friend of mine that she, the truth starts to the reason why is, is there's a friend of mine that I got to get to know that has a child with Down syndrome that asked her mom, Katie Driscoll, and said, like, I would love to have a, a mentor, a role model to look up to. And as soon as that was mentioned, Katie, the mom, was like, okay, why don't we find the right channels to see, see who's out there? They found me. And that is the true start to what happened. So it was to... Um Provide role models as well to yes. give exposure. Well, yes, yeah. yeah, role models in really known companies, mm. as well as me, within the entertainment industry. So you are a role model, Jamie. So I mean, how do you feel about being a role model? It's well, role model and advocacy go hand in hand because mm. advocacy is also part of being a role model as well, and it's. It's honoring, truly honoring. 
And you, I mean, that leads me on to my next question because you have done a lot of advocacy work. Yes. Jamie, you've, you've done some amazing things in Texas and Tracy mentioned it earlier. Well, yeah, well, yeah. Texas and also later on through the years back in California, being back in California. And so can you tell me a little bit about your advocacy work because you were involved with the Ark of Fort Bend and yes. got some legislation changed. So can you tell us a little bit about that story? Well, that's where I moved to. <laughs> so um, I started through Treasury, working with the money <laughs> side, and then through there, I got in, they were still were trying to find a good structure and, and, and structure and, and organization skills. They were like, okay, what's going on here? We need someone in charge. And at one point, we did some advocacy elections through, uh, I don't remember which month, or what, which month, but during these elections, we kept getting different roles. And we're like, okay, this, who wants to be treasurer? Who wants to be this? Who wants to be this? Who wants to be president? And you're also looking at a president of that local chapter for, for two years running. So you were elected president for two years running? Yes. Of that, of Arca Fort Bend? Yes. Amazing. And then from there, as being as in my presidency, I was also I, I've been get, I was given the chances in being part of higher up and, and in the political ladder and going into a government a governmental affairs committee, and that's where we read the bylaws for the state of Texas and realized that there was a certain term involved with individuals with, with the, not just with Down syndrome, but with all disabilities, which we all know is highly offensive. That offensive in, in many ways. We changed that term of retardation to intellectual developmental disabilities. In legislation, that's true. In, in legislation, in the federal legislation. So now we do not use that term, and that's one thing that I'm, I'm advocating that it, it needs to be globally. It's very good. It's amazing work that you've done. So that's all my questions. Thank you. I <laughs> thought we would open it up to the audience. If the audience has any questions for you, Jamie, we would love to hear. Yeah, don't be scared to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jamie. Hi, Genevieve. Um, my name's Barley Pada. Um, I am the, uh, I, w I do a lot of work similar to you, Jamie, in advocacy as well, and I'm the co-chair of the um, e Equity Diversity Committee here at Actors' Equity. And um, recently we had a, an amazing achievement of getting casting directors on board in creating a new policy in diversity and casting in all facets of the work that they do, um, which is awesome. Uh, but I'm already foreseeing some challenges that we're facing. Uh, we still struggle with a lot of issues of, you know, subconscious bias mm -hmm. um, or, you know, people coming up with the hurdles or barriers of like, well, we don't know how to work with these people. We don't know mm -hmm. how to engage them. Are there any sort of suggestions or solutions perhaps that you've seen in the work that you've done that you've seen with companies that you've worked with that they have implemented in the work that you've done with them that we could incorporate here? Um. So basically, you need to with, 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 with structure and organization. Um, meet with the individuals and get them all together. Ask them what their opinions are, and start working from there mm -hmm. and seeing what they might want right. to have done, and really facing the issues head on. Finding the different way, finding ways to um, ad address the issue, and, re and finding the resolve. And the resolve it needs to be a team effort, not just solo a team effort. Great, excellent. Thank you. And eventually, oh, I'll be asking you if I say any concept because if you want some more help, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I do a lot of help with that. <laughs> That's wonderful. It does require discussion, round table, getting on the same yes. page. 
Beautiful. This is similar to a table read, but my own is a <laughs> Hello, Jamie. My name is Marianne, and I'm one of the co-founders of WITS, the Women in Theatre and Screen. Um, you, your advocacy work is incredible. How, how have you learned to become a leader? I mean, I imagine you were born a leader, <laughs> <laughs> but how would you describe your leadership style to um, have an open discussion and really change people's hearts and minds? Naturalism, positivity, and also keeping in mind and, and listening to to heart. <laughs> the biggest thing is the heart. And at the same time, even though your family may bug you at certain times, <laughs> but also listening to family and friends. The encouragement for leadership starts at home. Thank you. Very good. Mm -hmm. um, did you always want to be an actress? Did I always want to be an actress? Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> I wanted to find a way of my own in changing lives. As in with Dionysus, one, one of the things that we have, our motto, is changing lives one act at a time. So it's those kind of messages that, that has always inspired me. And music and everything has been around me, so I wouldn't be part of it. Hey, Jamie. Hey. My name is Sarah. Um, I work for Accessible Arts. I'm organizing the Arts Activated Conference this year. But I'm also a performer, and I've done work in the circus, and I've actually played a dog and run around oh. the stage. <laughs> <laughs> run for 60 shows, like running around on stage for an hour, and I think you made a good choice about going really? with Sally. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. But my question, um, I wanted to know more about American Horror Story because huh. I'm like – major big fan of Ooh. the Freak Show series, like super big fan. <laughs> um, so excited to be here in your presence. I, when I watched American Horror Story, I thought the scripting was excellent mm -hmm. and I thought that the research in the script was phenomenal, like really good. Yeah. And so I have two questions really. Mm -hmm. The first is, did you like sometimes tell the writers what would be better to say? Like, was there um, some talking around between the actors and the writers about the best way of portraying certain characters? Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing is, I w sorry if it's it's okay to ask two no, questions. Fine. That's, that's on set. <laughs> A lot of the writers within Mark and Horror Story are very um, focused, driven mm. on things, so um, it's hard to grab them in an office. Yeah. So <laughs> it's better to grab them on set. I can understand <laughs> that while you're doing it, right? Because it's very clever. The scripting is extremely clever. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, what do you say to people when they ask you about freak shows and being on American Horror Story? Because I'm a freak show performer in, uh -huh. in live, in theatre, and I always get that question of, oh, but you have a disability, why are you doing freak show? So do you get that question about horror and American Horror Story? Um, it's okay if you don't. Off and on, off and on. Is different though. <laughs> they, people ask it in really unique ways. Mm. So your delivery of your question is really quite neat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, when it comes to American Horror Story Freak Show, the writing of it is really quite unique because mm. it brings in physical disabilities. Yeah, yeah, it's really clever, isn't it? Yes. Mm. With me, with it's really neat seeing the transformation of a two foot wooden doll to me. When you see New Patrick Harris and his point of view, that's where you see me mm. in that, which is really kind of neat. Mm. It's really neat. There's yeah. friends of mine that are part of that that I recently met because of the show that may have be, have been said as freaks, but they're not. Mm. One, uh, there are several mm. of them. One of them is kn known as the world's tallest model. Her name is Erica Irving. They are really sweet to be around. One of them has recently, a uh, while, well, bless her soul and heart, she has recently passed, but is Rose Siggins. She always went around on a wheel not wheelchair, went around on a skateboard. But uh, with everybody there, they have not let 
those disabilities, and, and they don't see it as uh, they don't see it as disability. They see it as a blessing, and that is the and that's, and that's the biggest thing about it. Yeah, and I, and I think for me it, that really comes through mm -hmm. in in things like American Horror Story. The yeah, the, the strength of character and the yeah. strength. It's well done. It's fantastic. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, Jamie. I'm Lisa. I'm a producer. I wanted to ask you, what's your dream role? What <laughs> What would you like to do? I could do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um. You know, a lot of people say self role on it, but um, I would want to um, really diversi diversitize on roles that can, that are unlimited. They, they, they can have an unlimited, um, a, a limited amount of, of hobbies, from writing to producing, directing. Being a lawyer is another one that's anything that has really prominent occupations that can really use that I can really, really utilize my voice and it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt for me to send to uh, wouldn't hurt that eventually having a character that because I may be a girlfriend a fiance a wife a mom because there's another thing that with women in the industry and women with disabilities those are roles that we some that we really try to, to go for and I want to be one of those women. I don't this one want to be a person with a horror <laughs> and possibly something in comedy <laughs> as well with a short film called Kill Off. Um, I also I want to do roles that I can that I can show every side of me. No matter if it's drama, I no matter if it's drama to comedy, I want to show every single side. I want a character that, that embodies every single side of who I am. That's great. Thank you, Jamie. It has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for coming and t talking to us and doing this Q&A. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But also, I'm very open for pictures. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, you're killing me. You really are a hard act to follow. Um, that was amazing, and I think it was great to end on your your inspiration and your desire to play any role. Um, the lawyer, the girlfriend, the fiance, the mum. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I would now like to introduce Nathan Bashar, who is part of the Bus Stop Films alumni. Nathan is a unique motivational speaker pushing boundaries. He may have Down syndrome, but he says that's not who I am. He has spoken at international and national conferences, political forums, unis, schools, workshops, sharing his insights about what can happen when people are encouraged to live their dreams. Nathan is going to encourage all employers in the room to think about inclusive employment. Nathan himself works and contributes to society. He works in two creative offices at Nova 969 and at Taste Cre Creative, Genevieve's boutique creative agency. In 2015, he won the award for excellence in employment inclusion at the New South Wales Disability Industry Innovation Awards. And recently, Nathan became a 2016 New South Wales Young Australian of the Year finalist. I'd like to welcome to the podium, Nathan Basha. When I was born, some 24 years ago, the village doctor said to my parents, I think your baby has Down syndrome. You have three choices. You can institutionalize him, adopt him out, or take him home. How is it that someone can categorize our life like that? Sometimes in society, there are barriers and needs can create fear. They can control people. Putting barriers on people holds them back. So by bringing down these barriers, who can reach their potential? What is potential? Well, my dictionary tells me that the Nathan Erie is very handsome, charming, <laughs> and creative. <laughs> it also tells me that the human potential is an exceptional quality of life filled with happiness, creativity, and fulfillment. However, the potential 
of some people is limited by social barriers. It is clearly the case when it comes to people with disability who are not equally valued and included in society. Employment is a key area in which this occurs. Throughout my life, I have been given and have taken advantage of job opportunities. My job working at Chase Grave is a meaningful job that I am passionate about. I was able to get this job because of my experience studying with bus stop films. Over the last four years, I have been an eager student of bus stop films. I was already passionate about film, but I was able to discover more. I could learn about how films are produced, and the rice strips and diabet. I can now probably say I'm a first assistant director, a production assistant of two internationally award-winning films. This was saw me directing things and providing advice to the director. I was also a co-director on Hopley and Beauty, which last year screened as an, as an Oscar qualifying film festival. My friend tour was including Best Experimental Film at the Vada Film Festival. Two bus stop films. I've also been paid to do film reviews and blogs. Often people with disability, when they finish school, do not have an interview to continue their learning around something they may be passionate about. The course has provided with not only a learning opportunity, but Understanding the intricacies of film has helped the students in many other ways, such as an increase in their self esteem as they are able to converse at the very deep level about something they and others are interested in. We have learned about commitment, time management, and independent travel. As most of us get ourselves to the course via public transport. All these views I have been asked to get ready for employment. My role at Taste Creative is being the team assistant. One day a week, I provide the team the support they need to be able to efficiently get film projects completed. This is me working on the film shoots. This includes keeping the office tidy. Any free hopping, filing, film blogging, on many occasions, I have helped out on the film shoots, working with the camera department, using their equipment, and keeping the team refreshed on the film shoots, assisting the director with anything they need, and a whole lot of other tasks. None of this would have been possible if it had not been for my exposure and involvement in bus stop films. In my employment at Tescave, I am valued, respected, and a contributing member of the team. Unfortunately, this is not the reality for a lot of people with disability. I have a vision in which all people are valued and have the equality of opportunity to lead fulfilling lives by achieving their innate potential. So why are we here today? Well, I am not just here for the few drinks. <laughs> or because I look good. This is a call to action. I invite you to be a part of a generational change. Together, we can change the lives of people with disability and make the community that we share more fair and just. I tell people that I'm living the dream. What I mean when I say this to people, that I'm following my passion that they use film. I mean, including in to work and participate in this industry has made a big impact to my life. Not only am I living the dream, but I'm also learning to become more independent and more efficient at works and live in my own home and get to travel more. It would be, be great opportunities for more people to live their dreams too. And what would this do? It would enable a person with disability to feel valued and respected for their contribution to your team. So when you get back to the office or film set, big or small, when you come across barriers from others like, will we employ someone with a disability or we don't have any jobs that they could do? Please change this. Change is not always easy. Change happens. One gesture, one person, 
one moment at a time. Thank you very much. Again, thank you, Nathan, for sharing an insight with us about your work experience and the opportunities that it's given you and, um, and what you're getting out of it and what you're giving back. That's fantastic. I think it's a great time to um, mention that if there's anyone here that's looking to provide opportunities for inclusive employment within their workplace, we have um, Job Support here tonight, an organisation that helps businesses employ people with disability. If I can get um, Gabrielle and Sam to to stand up so people know who you are. They'll be here um, and they've got their stand up in the foyer to answer any questions. Um, so if you'd like to have a chat with them about how um, you can make your uh, employment at your workplace more inclusive, speak to these guys, they can point you in the right direction. Next up, uh, we have Luke Buckmaster. Luke is a writer, film and TV critic and public speaker. He's currently a film critic for The Guardian Australia and film critic for The Daily Review, as well as a contributor to publications such as BBC Online, the Australian Centre of Moving Image. Luke has lectured at cinema for La Trobe University and in 2010 won the Australian Film Critics Association Writing Award for his review of I'm Still Here. Luke will be helping us reflect on how we have represented disability within cinema and help us question what we can do better. Please welcome Luke Buckmaster. Wow, what an amazing Q&A. What an amazing Q&A and what an amazing speech from Nathan. Uh, talk about tough acts to follow. Um, wow, um, it's, you know, it's great to be here. I've got the history lesson part of tonight, so apologies in advance for that. Um, it is terrific to be contributing to the conversation around diversity on our screens and also fantastic to be here from the perspective of somebody who got completely freaked out, Jamie, by American Horror Story. <laughs> I just kept coming back though every season, <laughs> terrific performances, uh, so thank you. Uh, I was asked basically tonight to, to talk about the history of representations of disabled people in Australian cinema and to put some context around uh, where we are today and, and where we came from. So putting my uh, history teacher sort of hat on for the moment, the first depictions of disability in Australian cinema were probably in films made around the time of the Great War, uh, from 1914 to 1918. Um, so not long after the, the turn of the century. And I say probably because uh, most of those films, the vast majority of those films, even the commercial smash hits, uh, sadly uh, have become lost in time. In terms of narrative features, which is what I'll focus on uh, for this evening, the first Australian film I can think of with the disabled character as a key participant is Charles Chevelle's In the Wake of the Bounty. Uh, it's from 1933 and the film is narrated by a blind man sitting in a pub, a truly, truly Aussie way to start this, uh, this sort of subgenre or this genre. And Chevelle returns to this man periodically as a sort of framing device in the narrative. The actor's performance, uh, and I can say this because without fear of retribution, because he's obviously long dead now, is not very good. Uh, this guy seems to sort of interpret the role as an opportunity to squint into the distance and look a bit vacant in between ranting and, and, and raving. Um, so not great. And now I'm going to skip uh, forward through the 40s, 50s and 60s. And you understand why I did that slight jibe about that actor in a moment. Uh, and into the 1970s. And the 1970s was the birth of, of the Australian film industry in terms of its sort of modern incarnation. In 1979, the same year, Mel Gibson wore a leather jacket for the first time and became a road warrior with a certain crotchety temperament. He also played a developmentally disabled gardener in a film called Tim, uh, which is partly not remembered all that greatly, partly because it's not a fantastic film. The story involves Tim's relationship with a much older woman, bringing up themes of romance, responsibility, uh, and particularly with a sort of from the perspective of a carer or a, or a potential carer. It's a complicated theme and one that is not very well unpacked uh, by the film. Gibson's performance, and I do have to watch this because he's currently not only alive but he's in town. Uh, Gibson's performance doesn't, doesn't help. Um, his character seems pretty dim-witted, um, pretty simple, 
and his disability is not examined, I don't think, in a very thoughtful way. Like in the wake of the bounty, it's fascinating to wonder, to contemplate, uh, how much better these films would have been if a disabled actor had been cast in their roles. Five years later, we saw what could be achieved from this approach with a remarkable performance from a remarkable young actor. 1984, let's take a look now at a clip from Annie's Coming Out. Unreasonable of me to wish to make another attempt. Miss Hathaway? Let's try it again. Slowly, slowly. L. A. W. Y. That's enough, Miss O'Farrell. I would like everyone to leave the room. I wish to talk privately with Miss O'Farrell. Miss O'Farrell, may I call you Annie, between ourselves? Do you mind if I smoke? It's one of the most irritating things about being a judge, having to spend a whole day in court. Annie, I don't even pretend to know what life is like in the hospital. What I do know is what life is like in the world outside, a world where there aren't any moral absolutes, a world that is unfair, a world that does make demands on people. A world where you have responsibilities to other people and have to make choices. After all, Jessie is being doubted too. If you're not really using the board, she's either deluded or dishonest. Neither of them very pleasant words to carry. You owe Jessie a lot. You know that. What I'm asking you now, Annie, is this. Are you quite sure you don't owe her just one small sliver of those principles of yours? It's a film that's very much worth revisiting. Uh, it's not all about Bud Tingwell, by the way. It's, that's his kind of one scene to do the soapbox thing. Um, it's also a very strange film, and it's stranger than it seems if you look at this clip. Um, it be actually begins in the style of a B horror movie. Uh, we see vision of young kids locked up in hospital beds with huge bars on them, and we hear a, a young woman's voiceover narration speaking about her thirst for revenge. She says, the strongest emotion I felt was hate and hate made me strong. It's based on the true story of Anne MacDonald, who was born with cerebral palsy and spent the first 15 years of her life in an institution. Her carer fought to convince people, and he was physically but not mentally disabled and eventually won the war. The director of the film found a nine-year-old actor, who you saw on the screen, Tina Hondas, to play Annie, who also had cerebral palsy. It was originally intended for MacDonald herself to play this character, but by all accounts, when she was taken out of an institution, her growth was extraordinary and she became simply physically too large for the role. Annie's coming out, it, it, no, it's not a masterpiece. It's not a masterpiece, but it's a genuine one of a kind. It shows a real rage about a functional mind trapped inside a dysfunctional body. The film also shows the power of not just casting disabled actors to play disabled characters, but in extensively collaborating with them throughout the process from the ground up to make stories that, that feel real and feel compelling. Writer-director Rolf de Heer pursued this approach and then some 14 years later in, I think, a much better film, perhaps even a seminal film. Let's take a look at Dance Me to My Song from 1998. <laughs>
essentially a, a love triangle drama, and I guarantee you've never seen a love triangle drama. It's quite like it. The lead actor, Heather Rose, was also, who you saw on the screen, was also the co-writer. She was born with cerebral palsy, and the film was based on a fictitious screenplay that nevertheless closely mirrored her real-life experiences. Two years before Rose passed away in 2002, aged 36, she explained her approach to filmmaking at a disability conference. This is what she said. I wanted to create a screenplay, but not just another soppy disability film. I wanted to make a hot, sexy film, which showed the real world. In the years since Annie's Coming Out and Dance Me To My Song, Australian film has seen a reduction in roles played by disabled actors. Although, having said that, admittedly, the sample was so small to begin with, you can barely even pick up a pattern. One exception, and there are a few in recent years, one exception is Quentin Kennehan, who was born with a congenital bone disorder, famously stole hearts on Australian television with Mike Willsey in the 1980s. Last year, he had a small role uh, as Corpus, Corpus Colossus in Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> All roads lead back to the road warrior, it seems. Showing a character coming to terms with a disability uh, can create fascinating character arcs. In these sort of films, screen screenwriters often use it as a way to trigger the second act. Inspired by the story of his own mother, uh, the veteran uh, independent Australian filmmaker Paul Cox depicted a woman becoming blind in his 1986 drama Cactus. It's easily one of his most elegant and beautiful films, if not his most elegant and most beautiful. And on that note, just on a, on a, on that note, on a non-Australian note, I should say, uh, there's a documentary playing uh, in competition at this year's Sydney Film Festival. I thought I'd name drop it because it came to my mind when I was writing this speech. Uh, it's really extraordinary. It's called Notes on Blindness. It's an official competition. Uh, it's not Australian, but um, but see it if you can. It's it's the best film I've seen this year. This next example, uh, it's not quite as elegant as, uh, or as beautiful as Cactus, but it's still pretty great. Uh, this is a film famous for a scene where Jack Thompson gives a toast to his gay son and his gay son's new lover by saying the words, up your bum. And it's called The Sum of Us from 1994. Mates, I ought to beat the shit out of you. Well, why don't you try it? Get out. Get out of here now. You can come back once for your things when I'm not here. Then that's it. I never want to see you again. He doesn't mean it, Gregory. He's angry. No, he does, Mum. Damn right I do. Fair enough. Here you go, Dad. I fixed it up a treat, mate. <laughs> now, we can talk to each other, sort of. What do you think? It's good, isn't it? No, it's not silly, mate. It's good. It works well. Right after that moment, uh, Jack Thompson breaks the fourth wall and he, um, and he turns to the camera and he says, the worst part of getting a stroke is people treat you like a fucking idiot. <laughs> this is a character who exists in multiple um, sort of conditions, if you like, it's sort of pre his stroke and post stroke. We didn't see that in that, in that clip, but um, it's a very interesting character arc and, and perhaps this means casting uh, an actor who be uh, a character who becomes disabled in the course of a story. Perhaps that's more of a justifiable reason to cast a non-disabled actor. But wouldn't it be fascinating if for a change we saw it the other way around and we saw a disabled actor go through that journey? I've never seen that. And some of you surely would be filmmakers, so get cracking. Yeah. One of my favourite films to come out of America last year is called Tangerine. It's a, a hyper-stylized comedy drama, famously shot on an iPhone about the lives of transgender sex workers in LA. When I spoke to the film's director, Sean Baker, on the subject of diversity, this is what he told me. As we know, trans people have a very hard time finding employment. On just that level alone, 
of being a decent human being, why aren't they casting people who might not be able to get anything else? Secondly, in terms of where we are in history, isn't it time representation and diversity in general is taken more seriously? I think the same logic applies to other groups, including disabled actors. And I would add to what Baker said, not out of a sense of charity, but because in the clips we've seen tonight and many more, they give superior results. Better performances, more powerful stories. Australian cinema, which doesn't follow the same commercial drive and impetus as Hollywood, is in a unique position to do this. It's a very exciting space and it's one we don't return to often enough. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Luke, for that history lesson and giving us an insight to what we can learn from film and what we can take away from it tonight to, to take back to our creativity and our workplace. Um, now I'd like to hand you over to the person that brought us all here tonight, the star of the show that you know, works alongside Jamie. Um, I would like to introduce back to the lectern, Genevieve Clay-Smith. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers here tonight. Thank you, Luke. That was brilliant reflection on disability representation in cinema. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Tracy, for emceeing. Thank you, Martin and Courtney Heptadestroff. Thank you, Courtney. And thank you, Paul, as well. It's lovely to have you here. This is a really exciting, um, this is a really exciting night. And I want to thank you all here for being a part of a very, very, very important conversation that is long overdue. You know, the point of tonight has been to start a dialogue about inclusion and diversity in our film industry and to encourage us not to put limitations on people with disabilities. Tonight has given us an opportunity to reflect upon the status quo and begin the journey of changing it. Tonight has given us the opportunity to reflect on how we can and should be employing people with disabilities in our production offices and on our film sets, and how we can and should be giving actors with disabilities the opportunity to audition for roles within our cinematic landscape. By making these decisions, we can collectively, as an industry, enable people to reach their full potential. Let's also be aware of the power and influence of this industry. When we misrepresent the experience of people with disabilities in our films due to a lack of consultation, we are showing audiences an inauthentic experience that can perpetuate ignorance and negative stereotypes within our society. It is so important for us to be aware of the power that we wield as storytellers and filmmakers and how that power can be used to shape our society and culture. It is important for us to consult with people with disabilities, to bring them into the conversation when we decide to tell a story about a person with a disability. It only makes for a more exciting and vibrant story in the end. When I was in university doing my undergraduate degree, I made the film Be My Brother starring Jared O'Dwyer, an actor who happened to have Down syndrome. In making this film, I had an opportunity, a small opportunity as a student filmmaker, but an opportunity nonetheless. I decided to be inclusive. I held a filmmaking workshop for a hand of people with, a, with disabilities who are interested in learning about filmmaking and interested in working on the set in a friend's living room. During the workshop, they learnt about different crew roles. And on the 16th of September, 2008, we all came together to make a film. And we even finished an hour early ahead of schedule. And that film won Tropfest in 2009 and Jared O'Dwyer took away Best Actor. You know, when that happened, it showed me something. It showed me that involving people with disabilities in filmmaking isn't complicated. It's not complex. 
it doesn't compromise on quality and it didn't slow things down. And these are stigmas that are present within our society. Stigmas that we must face up to, challenge and change. I'll never forget the words of one of my favourite high school drama teachers and it stuck with me throughout my whole life. He said, you might not change the whole world at once, but you have the power to change the world of the individual people you meet, one person at a time. You know, we can change the world and this industry one person at a time as we give people opportunities to reach their full potential in front of the camera and behind it. As we broaden our understanding of the human experience and cease to view people through the lens of judgment, we will have the opportunity to give opportunities. You know, I want to encourage everyone here tonight to have higher expectations of people with disabilities. <coughs> One of the many barriers to inclusion that people with disabilities face is low expectations. When we prevent a person from engaging in an opportunity because we assume and judge that they can't do something, we rob them of their opportunity to reach their full potential. If you're an employer, you might think about hiring a person with a disability in your workplace. And like Tracy mentioned earlier, we actually have staff here from Job Support. Um, Gabrielle and Sam, who raised their hands. Well, you can raise your hands again if you like. Check them out. <laughs> you know, Job Support is a not-for-profit disability employment service and global leader in the field for people with a moderate intellectual disability. Um, over the past 30 years, Job Support has dramatically improved the lives um, of people with disability through giving them opportunities to, uh, to be employed and have meaningful employment. And so, you know, I think it's a really important thing that we are bringing people into the workforce and ensuring that they meaningfully, are meaningfully contributing to our community through their passions. Just like Nathan is meaningfully contributing in our film industry right now. So everybody can jump on board this and give opportunities. So to finish off, I want to thank everyone from the Australian Film, Television, Radio School for sponsoring this event. Carolina Totterman has done an amazing job of pulling this all together tonight. Um, Penelope Thomas, Martin Brown, and of course Neil Peppolo, the CEO, who has just backed Bus Stop Films 100%. It was only four, four months ago that we had our first conversation, and here we are now. So, you know, he's a guy that's make, getting things done. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone at Screen New South Wales for all your support of Bus Stop Films and passion in making uh, this conversation at the forefront of our film industry right now. In particularly, I want to thank the uh, Screen New South Wales CEO, Courtney Gibson, who has really backed Bus Stop Films as well. It's been really wonderful. And also, um, uh, I want to thank you to Tracy Corbin Matchett, who has done a brilliant job of emceeing tonight. And she actually reached out and connected Bus Stop to Screen New South Wales. So, you know, we wouldn't be here without that either, Tracy. So, thank you so much. Um, all media coverage about Jamie advocating for inclusion over the last few days, and there's more that will hit our screens soon, is because of the wonderful efforts of Screen New South Wales and Afters and the wonderful Tracy Mayer of Tracy Mayer PR. And I want to thank Tracy and Charlotte Craig as well for all the effort that you've put in to raising the conversation about this in the media. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank Emily Van Oshmit. Can you just stand up? She's behind here doing all the screens. <laughs> I <laughs> um, thank you, Emily. Uh, Emily's from our um, bus stop film sister company, Taste, and has put in a lot of hours to um, pulling together some, the tech and liaising with all the speakers. And she's done a marvellous job. And it's really important I do these thank yous because it is a team effort. And without coming together as a team to get this conversation on the table, nothing would get done. So thank you to everybody who has played a part in getting this conversation started. So let's all here tonight be a part of making some incredible social change in our film industry. Let's put a stake in the ground here tonight 
and choose to make our wonderful film industry even more vibrant and fabulous by giving people with disabilities their voice on screen and behind the camera. Thank you.